Because, like, I'd write Excuse me, sorry. All right, I'll call on the screen. It's like Christian Order for Tuesday, August 20th. Please join me in the blood. The United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us the wisdom to do what's in the best interest of those that we sell that we serve. We ask in a special way that you watch over the family of Senator John McCain, true American hero. We ask that you also watch over those who are protecting us and their families. We ask all this through your son. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, I will accept the motion. Well, I guess we need to do roll call. Commissioner Kirchner. Here. Commissioner Stacey. Here. Here. I'll accept the motion to uh, approve the digital audio video recording of the board meeting from August 21st. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Stacey? Yes. Commissioner Kirchner? Yes. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Okay, here we we'll go right into old business parking. I think that's Mr. Thomas. Yes, we'll put the graphic up. So, right what we're talking about. so through the, the discussion with the parking committee and meeting, we've, we've numbered spots and we've had, had the opportunity to start implementing that. So the, the, everyone who's in the Justice Center currently, the RTA and Commissioner's Office have assigned parking spots, so we're through that process. Uh, with Judge Meyer moving uh, <coughs> down the street to the Justice Center in the next couple months, we don't have assigned parking for his staff of 30, 35 people. So uh, the recommendation was to create some additional parking near the adjacent Calvert lot. So. Mm -hmm. Just to give everybody a point of reference, make sure I have this right. This is uh, Jefferson Street. This is Madison Street. This is existing student parking for Calvert. This is the existing green grassy lot. And so what we can do is we can create about 50 spots over here. About 35 of them will need for juvenile probate uh, assigned parking. And this green lot is currently owned by the diocese and you know for the use of Calvert but uh, they don't have any immediate plans to utilize it and they could use additional event parking so they're amenable to giving us um, a very low lease on this this grass green area and, <clears throat> and they, they then they would be able to utilize the parking off hours when the county doesn't need it. So, uh, in order to line, there's an alley that comes through the art from Washington Street up here down this alley, past the RTA, past Barga's office. There's an alley that comes down through here. So, in order to line this entrance up with that alley, so that if somebody comes down this alley, they don't have to turn against traffic on the one way. Uh, we need to secure a lease with East Tower, which owns a small sliver of that land, so we can shift this parking over and have this, this entrance. And so they're amenable to it at this point. So we've got some contracts that are out for discussion, and I just wanted to bring it back in here and you know have, have our discussion to make sure that what, uh, what we're pursuing is amenable to all, all my fellow commissioners. So one of the questions we had is, uh, will you, would you be willing to, to create uh, some beautification with this, this parking lot? And what, you know, what I, I think we believe, you know, I, at least I believe, that while that's an important goal for the, uh, the community, it's beyond the scope of what the county should do. So that's, there's foundations in place for beautification of the, the city and so what I would suggest is that we create the infrastructure these are islands and islands uh, that could receive some landscape or lighting in the future 
and that we pursue that with the foundations uh, and not uh, pay that out of the county coffers. Uh, we only have business hour uh, needs for parking. Uh, they, they occasionally will need this extra parking uh, as the judges <coughs> tell me for jury selection days. We bring in perhaps 50 or more people for jury selection and that lasts a day and that, that crowds the, the current parking situation in downtown. Um, we have not applied to the foundation, so I don't know those answers. Uh, essentially, the business part of the deal is, and I just have some high-level estimates. I don't have bids from the uh, contractors. Obviously, we haven't gone to bid, but I have some es estimates, and M&B was gracious enough to give us some, some high-level estimates. So the terms of the lease are if for this portion, the, the Calvert portion, we'll repay that. The estimate is about 20000 and then we would have a 10-year uh, lease on the grass portion. So for $20,000, uh, you know, basically amortized, it would be $2,000 a year, and uh, but we would pay that up front, and that will make it look like it's one seamless parking lot. And then we have another 56000 in creating this pat parking. That's just the asphalt. And then uh, an additional uh, 27,000 in curbing and, and concrete work. Of course, that all has to go to, to bid, I, I think. So I, I, it's probably all going to be bid as one package. The city of Tiffin has graciously agreed to uh, do the design work. So they've done a number of iterations on this parking. And this is the, the parking that provide parking schematic that provides the most parking with some landscaping uh, that makes it make it look look like it fits in the, in the downtown um, also uh, once this deal is consummated and we're all in agreement then the city has in, in spirit agreed to provide ongoing maintenance for this on this lot so uh, we don't have that agreement in place yet, but, but that's been the, the, the spirit of the deal. So, um, yeah, so we'll have partners with Calvert, East Green, City of Tiffin, County, collaborative effort. Uh, hope to get some, some support from the foundations, uh, and that application hasn't been, been made yet. So. Commissioner Thomas, the yeah. arrows across the bottom there, that is, that's an existing alley? Yeah, that's an place? existing alley. Okay, so that we don't <coughs> do anything with that, but they'd have that for egress. Correct. And, and, and as they come down, those four versus have to Right. And Calvert doesn't lose any spots. <coughs> they use, utilize all their spots for their students. So So I guess uh, my question, when we first talked talk about this, it was between, uh, it was between 50 and 70,000, my estimate. I what you just talked about is 103, uh, 20 for Calvert, 56, and then, or, yeah, 56 for uh, the lot, and then 27 for curbing. Do we have a choking point on this uh, project? Yeah, I'm sure we do. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I mean, I think we're, we're close. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Okay, so what has our engineer said, the county engineer? Is the county engineer usually involved in any projects we have? I don't know the history of that. But he, he has occasionally offered to help us out with things, but I think that's what Matt Watson has done instead yeah, from the okay, city. Well, I mean, if it's a county project, I guess that I would feel much more comfortable with the county engineer having at least some input he, I guess uh, into a project of this size. We'd have to ask him if he wants to. It wouldn't be under his, his scope of work because he doesn't do parking lots, but he... Was he involved in the other parking lots he, we did? He did the commissioners. He does. He did the bid specs for the commissioner's lot and the RTA and the CSB okay. lots. Well, since this is over, we, do we have RFQs that need to go out for this stuff then at 50000 Oh, we'd have to bid. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'd, have to, we'd have to bid it. Okay. And we'd have to get the specs and be able to put it up. So the estimates are coming from whom? Um, Kent Grable did them for uh, the asphalt. So I think he's act he actually did several different iterations because of, you know, as we were changing the configuration. Well, I guess and I guess uh, they got Smith, Smith uh, Concrete did the, did the curbing estimate. 
Yeah, I guess we continue to further discuss it. it. Just scares me because, as I say, we originally talked 50 to 70. <clears throat> we had initial discussions, and at this point, we're up to 103. And typically, bids don't decrease. So I don't know where, where too much is too much to turn a uh, vacant lot into a parking space. But at this point, if we go ahead and get the, the bin specs together, if it, I mean, there have to be an engineer's estimate applied with that, yeah. correct? So I guess you can, we can ask Mark if he wants to be involved in that or interest or if there's that one applied, I don't, however, if we should work yeah. together. Yeah, I just, I, I felt it, it kind of furthered the collaborative effort, that since the Justice Center's a collaborative effort, and this parking creation is a, you know, a spin off of that, that we, that we the city, it, it would just be. I mean, from a political standpoint, from a reporting standpoint, it would make much more sense to me that mm -hmm. if it's a county lot, if the county engineer be involved in the process. Yeah, it's beyond his scope, but I, I'll certainly make that offer. I, I would welcome the, the assistance for sure. Okay. I think, yeah. So I just, I just want to make sure we're still on the same page and we're moving forward because. The draft of the contract, you know, is out for uh, consideration, and you know this is where it's at. And I just want to make sure that we're all, all on the same page. The alternative is to put uh, the, the the juvenile probate people in our existing lots, which would essentially eliminate any transactional parking for the county buildings. I just continue to be um, confused about all this because when I talk to places like Hancock County and Ottawa County, they have 10% of the spaces that the county actually owns in downtown Tiffin, and they're still able to survive with the employees they have in their area. So, I, you know, I'm not sure that we are in the business to have to supply a space to every employee that works downtown. Yeah, I mean, that's a choice. I, mean, I don't know that that's our responsibility. Choice, uh, you know, Wood Wood County has a parking garage, so that, I mean, that, there's probably a number of different ways to do it. Okay, investment portfolio. Um, we're well, still yes. parking. Yes. I did ask John to come in just because, like Shane said, we do have our spots uh, numbered. John, where'd you go? <laughs> Is he hiding somewhere? It's back there. And we weren't sure when we wanted to roll it out, when we wanted to start doing enforcement. So I kind of had John come in, get your guidance, maybe talk about it just a little bit. Sure. Um, if that's all right. Sure. So along with the concept of new parking, <coughs> we in turn have been working on old parking, um, the new Justice Center, more people, uh, city employees working in the Justice Center and we found a real <laughs> shortage of parking or I should say management of parking so what we've done we've taken the RTA lot the old Hanson lot and our commissioners lot here and we have assigned parking to our employees we are guaranteeing our employees like any employer would of a place to park their car <coughs> they will have special permits with numbers on them and that will be their spot and if uh, anybody parks in their spot they will be subject to ticket or tow and the way you designate the spots are these signs are in, in the parking lots now okay the green the parking areas those are county employees only from 7.30 till 5, typical business hours. Um, no public should park there. We have lots or uh, spaces for the public. They're in the yellow and they are limited to two hours because quite honestly, each lot has very few public spots. Uh, but there are enough and we've, we've been getting by as it is right now. But uh, the, uh, the idea is to get the public away from parking in the employees' lots. Um, we spoke of uh, Judge Meyer's group, the probate and, and juvenile courts, and with this new lot, that would absorb those 30-some people. Uh, just as an example, the commissioner's lot out here, I have 12 extra spots. Everything else is county, employee, county employees, 
city employees that are working in the Justice Center, <clears throat> all the county uh, vehicles that we run out of here, the fleet vehicles, city fleet vehicles, uh, obviously the commissioners and stuff. Hanson Lot has about 14 spots. Um, RTA has 18 or 20, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very limited in other words. So, uh, but the only way we could actually make this happen was to manage our parking. And uh, we've not enforced it yet. And this is what we're getting to. Uh, part of this meeting will be enforcement. Uh, maybe not conclusive, but we're going to. Um, we're going to have people in those lots in the morning, uh, making sure that they have their parking pass in their car, making sure they're a county or city employee. Uh, and if somebody gets there before us, they will be ticketed, $35 ticket, and they will be towed. Um, the, if we do something different and put the juvenile people in our lots, you can see how fast we will end up closing these lots up. They'll be, during business hours, they'll be strictly employee lots. So that's kind of where we're at right now. The signs are in place, the painting's in place, Everything's in place. Um, it's just a matter we, we continue to have issues. Uh, we're not having parking spot issues, but people parking in the wrong places. And uh, then our employees are end up on the street somewhere parking so they can work their afternoon uh, the rest of their day. So this is what's going on with these city lots. It has absolutely nothing to do with the health department and the prosecutor. We haven't even touched those guys yet. So this is just this side of Court Street, let's say. So that, those are decisions we end up, that we have to make now, what we're gonna do to enforce this. Have we done any marketing to in the newspaper to just notify people that there's been a change? No, not at this time. I, I think it was in a couple articles, but okay. I don't think uh, uh, we've actually done a, you know, hey, this is what we're doing and, and so forth. And I think we need to do that. Our parking committee, Shane and I were both on that. Um, you know, we realize we're gonna have to run an ad or something, let the public, public's gotta know. I mean, there's only so many of you here that understand it now, but the public needs to know because they're gonna get $35 tickets. And uh, that will be issued by the city. The city has already worked with us on that. And the city's idea of all this here, they're in here with us, is that we do offer some public parking for Washington Street. That seems to be going very well business-wise. So, you know, we offer them some in the, in the RTA lot, some in the Hanson lot, a few here for the businesses on this street. And uh, so we are offering the public spots to park, limited, I think, you know, we've got to limit it to two hours. Um, and then we got to figure out how to enforce that. I think the signs have been effective because I've seen people pull in during the business hours, whether it's lunchtime or otherwise, and yep. stop and look at that sign and drive slow, look at the colors of the lines, and then move to They have, other they have. And I think they understand that sign pretty well. And, yeah, I think it's been. And, uh, so still it needs to be brought into the public. Uh, to let them know that we, we do have a problem parking downtown here. Uh, but, you know, we're handling it. We're going to manage it as the county county needs to manage it for their employees. So do you want uh, some kind of direction from us as for when the enforcement <coughs> actually starts? I will need that, for. correct, yeah. So, Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess that it would be a question. Since the city's going to enforce it, I guess when they have the manpower to be able to do that, it would make sense. Um, well, it would be our manpower as well. I'm not sure if, uh, we'll have to have somebody in the lots reporting doing, to them. Doing the report, reporting to the city. And then the police are going to come down and write the tickets. And then they'll come down and write the tickets. Yeah. My suggestion would be that for the next 60 days we, we have a reminder flyer mm -hmm. and and we offer that, and then after 60 days, we start uh, start ticketing. And then in the meantime, uh, we do some advertising in the paper so everybody has the opportunity to see what the change is. Right. Does that sound fair? There's plenty of warning, I think. 
And I want to give a shout out to John and Julie's hiding back here, and especially Judge Schuff, who chaired the parking committee. It's there's no glory in it, but it's it's one of those things that's that's necessary. So I appreciate everybody's patience. It's not always been that, that much fun. But. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yep, you're welcome very much. Okay, now anything else on part? We'll move to the investment portfolio. We're going to talk about investment. Uh, <coughs> last meeting. Okay, so we use meter investment uh, management, and uh, yeah, Commissioner Kirshner, I mean, if you want to give some history on how how this came about. Uh, well, we, uh, you are instrumental in starting by statute we needed to have at least a quarterly investment portfolio committee meeting to review the county's investments and to make certain that uh, we're on the right track uh, and that we are keeping our investments safe uh, we hadn't done that in a number of years and uh, probably 18 months ago or so we began to do that during the first year I sat with the investment advisor along with uh, Damon all our treasurer um, and uh, went over the portfolio this year. Commissioner Thomas took over those duties. So we can kind of look at, this is an executive summary of what the investment portfolio for not only the county, but also, I assume, specific uh, other accounts within the county. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I appreciate you getting this started, Mike, and handing the baton off to me. That, that's uh, it's good, and it's good to bring it in here in the public eye. So, you know, essentially the, the general fund Securities for the county, uh, 25 million. I guess it's not all general fund, but it's it's all county funds except the engineer is 25 million, and the uh, engineers fund currently has investment of four four million one hundred sixty three. Uh, there's been a concerted effort to shorten the uh, weighted average maturity on the portfolios because of the where the interest rates are going and the flattening of the yield curve. So currently, the, the main fund is at two two years and 11, 2.11 years um, with a duration of 1.92. That gives us a yield uh, on average of 1.9 on that portfolio. Um, the economic outlook, you know, w along with this, we look at what the economic outlook is and what effect that may have on the 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 bonds that we hold and you know one of the things that we know is that it's a rising interest rate environment and the economy is strong so if you look at this you can see that in uh, 1231 of uh, 17 this is the curve we had a, uh, a pretty dramatic shift up and that's by Federal Reserve policy but the curve is very flat so there's no no reason to, to go out beyond here to pick up a you know a few basis points. So we're staying in this this area through here and getting the yield without taking um, much of the uh, bond risk as far as the um, changes in interest rates go. So this will reprice as bright rates rise. Some more information about uh, trade war, uh, what impact that may have. Uh, the unemployment rate. You know, we always we we always like to talk about the unemployment rate, and the unemployment rate is very good. Uh, my editorial comment is the participation rate uh, is still down from some of its highs. So there's more and more people on the on the wagon, and few pool, fewer pool. Fewer pool. So uh, inflation remains subdued. Uh, the outlook, the forecast. It looks like a very flat curve out beyond two years uh, in, in the near future. So we're going to keep keep on the short end. Uh, as far as the portfolio review, the main the main portfolio, the large portfolio, uh, you can see that 6.9 million of it is in uh, zero to one year, and 6.1 million is in, uh, under from the one to two years. So um, greater than half of it under two years and that's important because typically we buy securities and hold to maturity we're not looking to trade uh, securities or uh, mark them to market and that's important to note because you know we do have some unrealized losses in the the portfolio 
that uh, if we were to sell out the portfolio, there would be losses, but uh, not relevant uh, in our discussion simply because we hold to maturity and we'll take that, that yield through the whole, whole uh, duration. And then, of course, similar story uh, with the engineers fund and the securities they own. A very conservative portfolio. Uh, Damon does a great job monitoring it. I've been comfortable with our our advisors. So good. I, 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 the main message is that we've got twenty five million dollars in the bank as a county, and there is four million dollars in contingency funds. So we feel relatively comfortable with the fact that we've been able to put money away. And that's one of the reasons we, as this commission, have decided to try to start putting some specifically away for a, a budget stabilization fund uh, to make certain that when things don't go the way they have been going, that there's some money available for operations. Okay. Uh, September 18th meeting, uh, we looked at that. I understand that we only have one commission available that day. We do. Uh, can we move it to the 20th? Would that work for? Do we need a meeting? I mean, is there anything? Well, there's a there's a township meeting uh, that one that day of the 20th. I just want to make sure that we get anything covered we need to have covered before that before that meeting. Yeah. For now, I don't have anything scheduled, but so cancel it for now. And if you need something at it, how is? Yeah, we can do that. Um, I've got foster economic development that morning at eight um, and then just stuff will get ready for the commit that Northwest meeting on Monday, but nothing major. Okay. Well, I, all right. Well, let's, uh, what we'll, we'll do is schedule a meeting for 10 o'clock on the 20th and cancel it then if there's nothing to, if there's nothing to discuss. Uh, I hate to go through four weeks without some type of action possible. If we can. Okay, anything else under old business? Uh, hearing nothing, we'll go on to special counsel. Okay. Um, yeah, we need to get special counsel. Let me, let me, let me interrupt you, please. We have WSOS here. Oh, okay. For a 10.30 uh, meeting, yeah. so yeah. Uh, respecting their time. Oh, thank you. you let's uh, let's go ahead. Oh, there's others out in the hall. Oh, hello there. Hello there, Mrs. House. How are you? I'm going to let Ruthann start and put that up, Nikki. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, these are the folks from Mrs. Ruthann House, Executive Director of WSOS, soon to be something other than WSOS. Something to be up, yeah. <laughs> okay. Mom's the word. Yeah, it's soon to be in a new building. Yes. Anyway, so if you'd like to introduce the rest of your staff, please. Okay, we have Terry Jacobs. Terry is the Housing and Energy Director. Tiffany Shaver is now in our Planning and Development Department, has worked with the CHIP program for many years. And Marsha Walters is um, uh, our support staff on the CHIP side in the uh, office. So thank you for giving us this time to come and update you on the CHIP. Um, as you know, Community Housing Impact and Preservation Grant Program. CHIP uh, is much easier to say, but as you know, we've submitted an application on your behalf and the partnership's behalf, um, and we should know whether the next application is funded, hopefully next week. So running a little bit um, behind schedule again as we did the last round. But um, I just wanna say thank you for the partnership on the CHIP. Um, you know, as the state moves more and more towards, in many cases, regionalization and partnerships, um, they are incentivizing communities to come together um, in their applications on the CHIP, which uh, Seneca County and Tiffin and Pastoria have done and have done well. And I think one of the things we have been able to do successfully over the years, WSOS, in administering the CHIPs is to build that book of business within our organization so we have capacity we have contingency, we have backup, uh, we have the back office staff to support the things that are needed. We have the rehab specialists that can cross uh, counties and cities and, and fill in as needed. So we have lots of capacity and contingency. And so I think that's really one of our strengths. And of course, the end game is always services to the participants. And I think that is also um, a great strength of ours in this partnership in that we have lots of other resources to bring to bear 
on those participants. So we can combo the uh, CHIP funds with weatherization funds, utility funds, so that kind of thing. Um, one of the other things that the state and the Department of Housing and Urban Development mm -hmm. has done in the last few years is uh, employ milestones that need to be reached in order to get all, obtain all of the funding for the CHIP. And so Tiffany is going to really, I think, hit on those milestones and what we've been able to obtain. So, Tiffany. Well, just to support what you said, uh, and uh, publicly thank you for picking up the administration of some of the grants when there were periods of time when we needed somebody out there to do that and to review them and get them back on track. WSOS has been a great partner as it relates to uh, making certain that the county's grant administration has been proper, uh, even in times when there's been uh, gaps in the administration on our part. So thank you for that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe that our other partners are here, too, if they want to come in and <laughs> as, the, as the presentation indicates that this is a partnership. <laughs> It is a partnership with the city of Fostoria and the city of Tiffin. Um, about three, or actually PY14 um, was the first time that the state had instituted the partnership. So um, that's where we invited them as well. So hopefully I can operate this here. Um, so thank you guys for allowing us to come and speak. So we just real briefly where this grant started. Um, county and cities went into partnership. We just talked about that. Um, City of Fostoria was the grantee, or we call it the lead. Um, so they run the full administration, not just for the City of Fostoria <coughs> portion, but for the um, entire county. And thank you, Mayor Keckler, for uh, taking that. We appreciate it. And it's, it's not a matter of one taking over the other. It's just, you know, in the partnership, that's one of the things that they have to decide on is, who um, is going to be the lead. And we had a working relationship with all three partners, and um, so Fostoria took the lead, and um, actually in our new grant that we just mentioned, Fostoria will be the lead again. Um, the grant was awarded at $1.2 million, and there was an additional 178,557 in program income. This was money that came back um, from uh, home being paid off through the program and the program income is generated within each of the partnerships and then has to be spent within the partnership. So I'll get into that in just a minute how we uh, identify that. So the activities that were funded, private owner rehab is where we bring the entire home up to the standard that the state has set. Homeowner re repair, that's where when the inspector goes into the home, they identify what's the greatest need in this home. Um, and then that that is um, the item that is repaired. Um, those can be anywhere from a simple water heater replacement to we do ADA modifications, whatever the need is, um, then that's, that's what's done. Written into the grant was also rental repair, and originally we were going to work with Northland Homes, which is the housing provider for Seneca County um, Opportunity Center, um, but it didn't work out because we've worked with them in the past. They, we didn't have a home that worked, so we were able to just transfer it over to the owner repair and help an additional private owner. Um, Habitat for Humanity was written into the grant, and they were um, decided not to use it, just timing and, and that type of thing. It didn't work out. so. We were able to do an amendment and transfer the money over to <coughs> private owner rehab. <clears throat> How we get the word out, um, believe it or not, sometimes we think it's like the best kept secret, but it's really an excellent program, but it takes a lot of getting the word out there to the clients and participants that we serve. So these are just some of the things that we've done um, to help get the word out there. Social media advertisements and posts, Press release sent to area newspapers and radio stations. Brochures distributed to several locations. Um, flyers displayed at various locations. Presentations to local groups, council meetings, commissioners meetings. I've been a few times through the grant, uh, you know, here and at both cities presenting, um, letting people know that, hey, this is out there. Um, we called current HEAP and PIP clients. Those are the utility assistance programs. Um, so we have lists of those and we started making phone calls. And we utilize the United Way 211 system. Um, we need contractors to do the work. 
again, this can be a challenge um, to get the number of contractors that we need to spend the 1.2 million. That's a lot of a lot of work that needs done. So some of the things that we've done to get contractors, direct mailed uh, state licensed contractors. We attended area home shows to distribute brochures. Um, part of that too, we also did some client marketing while we were there. Um, we presented at service organizations, Rotary, Kiwanis, different things like that. Distributed contractor brochures to home improvement and contractor supply companies. Some of them allow us to put like a little stand there where the contractors, you know, have their contractor counter and that's really um, helped. Um, we also developed a list of, it was 689 contractors that we came up with and just started making direct calls. Um, you know, hey, this is the program we have to administer. And like Ruth Ann said, you know, because we have a wide reaching area, it's beneficial that, you know, when we're calling these contractors, we can tell them it's not just Seneca County that they have the opportunity to work with, that we work in, we actually administer this program in 21 communities throughout Northwest Ohio. So it makes it more of kind of an incentive for them to apply, knowing that it's not just the 1.2 million that we can offer them, so. Um, and we also did social media advertisements and posts. Contractor results, we did get 11 different contractors that bid on the current grant. Five new contractors since the, the grant has started and they're ready to bid on the new one. I wish they were lining up like that, but that's our goal, that's so. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a balancing act that needs to be done within this partnership. Um, it is all one grant and the state what they look at is as long as you spend the 1.2 million we're happy the program income's a little bit of a different story because that does have to be spent in the community in which it was generated but within the partnership agreement that both cities and the county went into we agree that we're going to watch the dollars and Seneca County brings X number of dollars to the grant, Fostoria and Tiffin, so we wanna make sure that we distribute that equally, or not equally, but with what they're, they're allocated. So we're committing funds between partners, meeting outcome goals, because in addition to not only to the dollars, but we have how many jobs we're gonna complete in each community, and then um, spending the program income, like I said, in the community in which it was generated. So this is, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of all three partners. <laughs> Seneca County, you'll see up at the top there, their allocation was 527,156. That was their grant funds plus their program income. The bar graph shows here the actual units that we have completed and these are within the county outside the two cities. So eight private rehabs and 17 home repairs. So we've exceeded the home repairs and that could be, you know, that we had some, because when we submit the application, we do the unit goals on an average. So they may have had some that were less um, expensive and so we were able to exceed then the outcome goals. City of Tiffin. Their allocation was 432175 Again, that's their grant and program income. And we were able to do eight private rehabs and 11 home repairs. And then the city of Fostoria. Their allocation was 369226 And we did five and then 13 home repairs there in their communities, or their community. So again, as Ruthann had indicated, that HUD has put into, HUD and the state of Ohio um, has put into um, effect some shortened timelines, they call them milestones at the state. And this was done because there's a 24 month um, commitment period from HUD to the state, and then our money comes from the state. So then they put it in. So if we don't spend it, it goes back to HUD and that's the last thing we want to happen. <laughs> so you'll see the first milestone we had was September 30th of 2017. We far exceeded that goal, I'm happy to say, because um, not only do they take the money, but then there's 
um, points on the next application and these grants are very 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 competitive so we want to make sure that we are meeting all of the timelines goals and, and that so it, it's critical that we meet these the next one was May 31st, 2018. Again, you'll see the committed, that's, it was right even because that was the goal for that one is 100% of, there's two different funding sources, actually three different funding sources, but it was 100% of home funds is to be committed. And um, so that's why it was equal because we, we did meet the 100%. But then the drawn, that's the money's, the job's done we're paying the contractor so we did exceed the drawn goal in on that one within this grant we had a little bit of a exception to our milestones they call it old funds because it was in it, the milestones are relatively newer concept from the state so there was some funds that they had that um, if they didn't spend them they were going to go back to HUD so when they were looking at the awards for these grants they had, and I don't know the total from the state, but they had some money that they needed to allocate, but it needed to be spent before the uh, milestones that were set within the, the grant. So Fostoria was chosen um, as one of the um, grantees that would receive these old funds. And the goal was the home funds, again, like I said, there's three different funding sources, home being one of them had to be 100% committed by August 31st of 2017. It was $426,000 of the 1.2 million that had to be committed. And the funds were committed by June 2nd. So as you can see, we exceeded that goal by almost <coughs> two months. Happy to say that because again, if we didn't meet that milestone, it would be points, we'd lose the money, all kinds of not good stuff. <laughs> This grant was one of three in the state that received the old funds. This was the largest of the three, so the state said, we have confidence in you, Fostoria and WSOS, that you can do this, here's the money. <laughs> and we were the only ones that met the deadline. So I'm happy to report that, that we were given a challenge and through the partnership, we were able to meet mm -hmm. that challenge. Um, how WSOS makes it all work. Um, first off, fantastic partners. Thank you guys. We appreciate. Without you guys, we you know wouldn't have it. So we appreciate that. Um, we have three intake staff. That that's all they do. They work with the clients on the front end of it, applying, helping them get the documentation that they need, going through the process that that they need to apply for the program. Highly trained and licensed inspectors, we have four of them. Um, they both, or all four of them carry lead abatement contractor, lead risk assessor licenses, they have lead training, they go to various trainings throughout the year. Um, I mean, they're the ones that are in the home making the decision on how these monies are going to be spent. So it's critical that they know what they're looking for, how to spend the money, how to write the specifications, to work with the contractors. So they've got a pretty big, uh, task and, and they do an excellent job at it. We have office support staff that's dedicated just to CHIP. We have two of them. Marsha works with CHIP and she's got uh, Sherry that works with her. That That's all they do is work on CHIP program, um, the paperwork behind the scenes and that type of thing. We have a marketing director that assists us with all of the outreach programs. Um, he markets for our entire agency but anytime we need some of all the <laughs> marketing I'd mentioned before, Alex is always there to help us. Um, <coughs> management staff that knows the program, Terry, Ruthann, fantastic. They, I mean, they help us out all the time. Great working relationship with the state of Ohio. Um, I mean, that's critical. You know, if we have run into a snag, a question, anything, it's easy. We call them up, they're there to help us. It's, it's a great working relationship and 53 years of experience assisting low-income families. Um, and as uh, Ruthann had mentioned, you know, we do a lot of combos. So it's critical. I mean, we're going into these folks' homes and it's not typically just a new water heater that they need. There's a lot of other supportive services that we offer 
that our inspectors are aware of or that our intake staff are aware of that they can then say, well, you know, I see that you might qualify for utility assistance or has your child, you know, a head start or various other programs that we offer that we're able to mention that while we're in their home, while we're meeting with them, while they're going through the intake process that, that really assists in that. So now I'm going to go through this is probably what I think the more exciting stuff is how the money is spent. So these are just some really quick snapshots. You can see on the left there, we get into some pretty ugly looking electrical situations. This particular home was a complete rewire. So they ran all new outlets, switches, light fixtures, new panels, what you're seeing here. It's hard to show the rest of the wiring, but. We installed the left one, right? Yeah, yeah, the left one is what we put in. We <laughs> Three years <laughs> um, this is kind of hard to see in the pictures here I and, um, but this roof had a sway back really bad it was leaking um, so it wasn't just a matter of going in replacing the shingles and walking away this is again where our trained staff they recognize that they identify that they're like okay this isn't just a simple roof replacement this is some structural repairs that we need to do here so again it's hard to see in these pictures but we did go in had to put in new roof trusses then we did put new sheeting and new shingles then on on top of it so now the client has a good roof over their head this here as you can tell on the left picture there was some energy and heat loss through that great big metal pipe there so we put in a brand new energy efficient furnace um, where we can save it that, that looks good. thank you <laughs> um, so we put in you know again there we're working with low to moderate income individuals so anytime that we can do projects that would help them with the running of their home saving money to run their home that's you know one of the things that we identify as a pretty high need as well another ugly electrical system that we found and again it was a full rewire so we were able to make this home a lot. Is that like a water line or a gas line right there? I the wouldn't be surprised. I think it's probably a water line and that looks like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would be surprised some of the things that we find when we go into homes. Um, but that, again, that's our trained staff come in and they know what to do, how to fix it. And, and so we go from there. And this particular home, the picture on the left was it was kind of a half kind of bathroom and a utility room and a catch-all room. And this client had a son, adult son, that was severely autistic and he had broken walls in their existing bathroom stall that, you know, just not able to, you know, with the assistance and that. So what we were able to do was turn this room that you see here on the left into a safer with the um, ADA shower for him. Um, and then the commode and sink, you know, so it's now a full, fully accessible ADA bathroom that we were able to put in for him. This was a roof replacement. This one, not quite as bad as the other one. It didn't have the sway back going, but I mean, shingles. Now, looking down the road, where we go from here, as Ruth Ann indicated, we hopefully will hear pretty soon about the new application. Um, it was submitted the first Friday in May. I think it was May 4th or something. Um, so we're kind of in a waiting game at this point. We'll hopefully hear on that. October 31st, all of the jobs have to be 100% complete. So there's some jobs that are a contractor have already been bid and awarded. They're just contractors are working on them. They all have to be done. Uh, January, February 19, roughly, if the new grant is funded, that's when the um, funds should be flowing. Um, there's a lot of paperwork and grant agreements and that kind of stuff that has to be signed. Um, so then we'll get that. And that is all that I have. Any questions? How has your success been in getting Bostoria and Seneca County contractors? I know the last time we talked, you were 
struggling. I appreciate the outreach, but uh, you know, I'm just kind of yeah. curious what, what kind of success. We have five new ones since this grant was funded. That and I, is there are you is there any more that you're aware of more recently? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I Seneca don't, County five new Seneca or new. new are Canada. you talking about? Local the county. five, yeah, the five that we have, I can't say they're all from Seneca okay. County. They are ones that have identified that they're willing to work in Seneca County. Right. Um, to answer your question, I'd have to get back with you on exactly how many of them are from Seneca County. Okay. Um, I can the tell you. The five's pretty good in our experience. Yeah, absolutely, five is yes. really good. Of yes. good contractors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. contractors yeah. are busy for sure. Yeah, they're, they, they're, they're very tough. busy. When the economy's good, it's really tough for us to get contractors. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think a little clarification, maybe why is it so tough to get contractors? A lot of us know the answer, but just okay. say the obvious is. So, Rudolph Libby, Mosier, the big companies, these are like twenty and forty thousand dollar jobs. They're just too small. Yeah. And then the Ma and Pa, you know, contractor, they're too big. They can't float a rehab for forty thousand dollars possibly. So there's this 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 small window of contractors that are interested in doing the work. Hmm. So, you know, we're always looking for more contractors, obviously, good ones, obviously. Um, there are some um, sub standard contractors out there that we aren't interested in, obviously. So we want to do good work and my staff, you know, demand excellence, as you can see in the pictures. And uh, we have, you know, state auditors come in and and go out into the homes and review all of our work and our paperwork and we always get excellent <coughs> marks so we want to continue that so we're picking on our contractors as well but uh, we're willing to give anyone a shot we usually start with a small repair or something and see how it goes but they got to jump a lot of hoops with the, the lad and you know they have to have a lot of um, they have their bonded yeah they have to have a certain amount of insurance and workers comp workers yeah comp there's an application process they have to go through to be able to and it's not i, I mean it is hoops but it's nothing i, I want to say it's nothing that the lead that they're required to have is a federal law i yeah. mean it's the federal rrp license that everyone is supposed to you know we just have to make sure that those are in place exactly. where on a private job, a homeowner's not going to ask no to ask, hey, can I see your RRP license? You know, so it's just those are things that, that you know, they, they and, may. And how long do they have to wait typically before they're paid off the contractor? Um, I typically say it's, I mean, six to eight weeks. Just okay. I, sometimes it could be quicker. The money's already in your possession, so you're administering no. no. it. has to go to the feds. The, no, the state. The state. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's a stumbling block as well. Cash flow. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. And then, yeah, like Terry said, you know, some of the small mom and pop, they, they don't have the ability to cash flow that thirty or $40,000 job. So it's you got to find that happy middle ground where it's not the Mosiers that can, <laughs> you know, but then you can't have the... the some of the contractors we've had some success, and I know right now we're in the middle one right now, they strictly did um, heating work. Yeah. But they're, they have other talents, and so we're working through them to say, hey, would you want to try maybe, you know, expanding your business? And, and uh, you know, obviously we provide, we can provide all the training and everything through uh, a company called Coed, <coughs> an organization, but it's at a very reduced price. I can't remember what the price is. It's actually free this free. year, yeah, okay. if they work so in the CHIP free. program. So if they get contracted with us and get hooked up with us, so if anyone knows anyone, send them our way. I would Call just say, you, Terry Jacobs? Or absolutely. All right. Three 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 six one zero seven. And that contract we're talking about, actually. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we can, you know, good contractor participation. Yeah. It, I mean, the country's built on competition, and that's what drives it, and that's what we need. So to keep the prices down as much as we can. So. And that contractor he's talking about actually is a Seneca County contractor. Yeah. He's yes. right in the city of Fostoria. So we're, you know, developing, you know, like that. So I guess my closing thing is I do want to thank Deb and Eric, you know, for their staff and, and that in administering the grant. You know, we do as much as the work, you know, as we can, but the grantee does have a 
a little bit of a responsibility for you know their fiduciary responsibility and um, also you know they have to write the checks when Marcia sends them a draw request they have to then you know cut it so thanks Deb and Eric yeah. for uh, your staff and, and administering the grant so well, it helps us too that we when we're out with the zoning and find properties and people don't know where to turn we have a place for them to turn so that yeah it, you know that helps us out a lot too Nice. It's an excellent program. I mean, we're blessed to have been gotten awarded all these years, so I'm praying that we get awarded again. I'm supposed to find out after Labor Day here. So, you know, uh, if we don't get a, you know, worst case scenario, we'll go after it again. Mm -hmm. Tiffany has taken a new position. She's taken Don Corley's position. I have some oh, huge shoes that. I'm yeah. feeling. So. So, so, but what we hope is with all you folks here today is that we get flooded with chip applications. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you, well, no, we have something way easier than that. Go to www.wsos.org. You can do a little pre-app at a kitchen in our system. Tell your friends, your family, your neighbors. We are always, always looking for applicants, so please check it out. And it's a very easy pre-app that you can submit, and it gets us get you in our system. Okay, so and I want to pay a little bit of homage to Don Corley. Don Corley uh, was our longtime housing development coordinator. Uh, he worked for WSOS for 42 years. <laughs> he was uh, formerly the housing and energy director for us for many, many, many years, and he has uh, recently retired, and so. Um, we've worked the last couple years in um, transferring capacity and skills so that we don't lose uh, everything with that loss, but um, he will be missed. And I just want to say, you know, you all have come to know him over the years, and we were very blessed to have him for 42 years, and we wish him the happiest of retirements. So. Everything else, Tiffany, thank you for the presentation. Yep. Judy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's thank do the picture with the head dress when I saw it here. We've got the mayor here. <laughs> 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 Is there a here? Yeah, I see. I, <laughs> 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 what do you want to do this? Yeah. 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 Just right here. Just right here. Just right here. themselves for dealing with the, uh, the wind matters and so we need to talk special counsel and um, made some calls Boris came 
to the top of the list. My centenary has worked in this field. I think it's probably a pretty short list of people who actually play in that field. So, uh, yeah, my recommendation well, well, is we, Okay, well, we talked, we asked uh, Stacy to call CCAO. Did you do that? I right. talked to John, and he didn't have any recommendations. Uh, the CCAO did not have any recommendations? No. The uh, County Commissioner Association of Ohio. Okay. Yeah, I ran a couple of names by him and uh, of firms, and he didn't have any. So do we have any estimate as to cost or hourly rate? Yeah, the, I mean, the hourly rates uh, depends on if you use associates or uh, full partners range from uh, to, they estimate from uh, 225 to 485. Mike Setnary rate bills out at 480, and um, you know we will have we haven't made any determination at what level we need to participate, whether we need to monitor and be or whatnot in these projects. But we you know, we need to get them on board and have that conversation. So at this point, do we prepare like a if if there's interest to move forward a contract to look at to if need be engage them yeah they have a letter of engagement here and we would forward that to the prosecutor to review and then he would usher the paperwork through for us to get special counsel I gotta tell you if that's the case the CCAO had no recommendations for us I'm, I'm extremely disappointed with that because you would think that they've dealt with this across the state why would they not have a recommendation for counsel for a commissioner's group, and they are the County Commissioners Association of Ohio. They, they have typically not, they don't issue policy on energy projects. They have stayed no, I'm not out of necessarily. That. I'm not necessarily talking about energy. I'm talking about uh, a firm that they might recommend to represent commissioner. Well, okay, for a firm that had experience in energy, so I'm, I'm just guessing that maybe that's why they don't, did not know. I don't know. He talked to someone who is an attorney but doesn't serve as an attorney for them. So would know of folks, so I, I can't speak for them. So. Okay, so is this same thing happening on the other side of the uh, issue? Do we have any trustees here? Do we have a council that we're hiring as well? Yes, we. Uh, there, we're actually having a, a meeting on Thursday that uh, Adams Pleasant. Uh, I'm, Bill, I'm just trying to get an idea as to the cost. Would you guys got any ideas what? Yeah, the, yeah, he has submitted some estimates for us, and uh, it's less than what uh, okay. uh, All right. the chain has presented stuff on that for the. Uh, I mean, it's just, I, I just, um, uh, I just think it's a shame here that um, uh, that our prosecutor has agreed to represent both and would do that, but uh, we have decided that you know, uh, we will not waive the conflict, and because of that, you know, we're talking about. Three or four dollars an hour for multiple hours on both sides of the issue. It's a significant cost to the county and to the townships. So, uh, how, how, where do you want to proceed, commissioners? Well, I'd like to motion that we uh, pursue special counsel with Borges, uh, with Mike Setton area I will second. Um, we had had some discussion that we needed to do this given the place where we were at. I don't think we can backwards. We're just, we've got to move forward from here. Well, the discussion that I would have was I would absolutely not support this unless I knew that we have some type of a cap and that we get other bids from other council on the hourly rate. You know, why would we, why would we not, why would we only have one uh, potential group to represent us? And there are literally hundreds of them across the state that might. And you know, we have one set of one set of numbers here. I mean, this is just not very fiscally responsible. So roll a suggestion, Mike, that I might have on that is when we were searching uh, uh, council out, <coughs> if you get a hold of the state bar association, they have a, a list of uh, attorneys who you know represent the energy industry and other uh, parts of that. So that might be an avenue to look at to get some other options and stuff with that to uh, 
maybe less than the cost if that's the way uh, you guys decide to go. But again, I'm with you, Mike, that you know, at one point in time, prosecutor was going to represent everybody, so now we have to use our funds to intervene against, you know, the... the uh, any other discussion? Call the question. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Stacy? Yes. Commissioner Kirshner? No. Okay, supplemental appropriations. I have a supplemental permit appropriations to the Metro mm -hmm. Fund. They're requesting $10,000 into travel. I have a resolution authorizing a fund transfer be made to the Loan Repayment Fund. Um, we got the fund put in place. Budget Commission certified the revenue yesterday, so we've got to transfer the funds for $50,000. Um, and then we have to put the money in place. So we have a supplement to the permit appropriations to the loan repayment uh, fund, putting it in their principal line of fifty thousand. And that's for the justice center loan that we received, uh, payback ten years, fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, I have a resolution authorizing an appropriation adjustment for the ditch maintenance fund. They're moving a total of fifteen thousand two hundred ninety-three dollars and five cents. I have a supplement to the permit appropriation to the Dog and Kennel Fund. She's asking for $3,752.60 in her hospitalization line. Um, I have a supplement to the permit appropriations to the DreTech Fund, putting $20,000 in the land bank fees, their other, other line. Um, I have a resolution entering into contract with JB Roofing, authorizing Stacy Wilson, County Administrator, to sign. Uh, this is for the two jail roofs that we already approved. Um, I have a resolution authorizing Seneca County Board of Commissioners to enter into an agreement contract with MP Dory. Uh, this is for guardrail installation. And I have a resolution authorizing the Seneca County Board of Commissioners to enter into an agreement contract with m and Asphalt. And this is for paving on County Road 19 and County Road 39. Um, there is an amendment to the contract that um, Mark has included uh, due to an emergency of County Road 32 road surfacing. So it would increase the amount, the amendment increase the amount of $187,709.50. Uh, I have a resolution authorizing the purchase of two 2019 international dump trucks through the Ohio Department of Administrative Services Cooperating Purchasing Program on behalf of Seneca County Engineer. Uh, total for both of those would be $168,496. And then I have a resolution authorizing Holly and Stacy to apply and sign for the Ohio Public Works Commission project agreement for the Ohio Local Transportation Improvement Program, Issue 1, Round 33. And that's various roads. And those are all the resolutions I have. Okay, I have a question about the engineer's changes on County Road. What? He's including uh, uh, County Road 19 and 39. Yeah, add, adding 32 is the emergency. And this added 187,000 to an 800. I think the contractor said beside you. Uh, the contract for the other is uh, like 800,000. In case you if I can add, being just in Adams Township, and, and I want to speak on Mark's behalf, but I think he tried something uh, new on 32 where he went in and he, and he ground a surface off and then went in and just tar and chipped it and it made a disaster out of it. Uh, a lot of complaints that we received from the township because the road's so rough and it didn't work out like he thought it should. So now he's got to go in and put a, a surface on top of it to smooth it out. So. I just know what the normal procedure is on a rebid for an addition of 20% to a project. But eight hundred thousand dollar project, you're adding about two hundred thousand to it. It's more than 20%. Yeah, but it, it's an additional work, and it's an emergency situation. And by code, you we're allowed to. Um, he 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 solely declares emergency, or yes. we, we declare the emergency. He, he did. 
he declares the emergency? Is that the way it works? Yeah. For, for his project. Yeah. And that's his, that's his fund on his. Yes. His ruling. His ruling. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Need a motion to approve the uh, resolutions? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Stacy? Yes. Commissioner Yes. Okay, uh, so all the administrative signings are done. We are open to general public comments. Now, what? I've got, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just have two things I want to ask. Couple public comments. You have two things you want to what? Say in public comments. Oh, okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let's let's set the ground rules here because sometimes it's not a little haphazard. Uh, if you have limit the remarks, please come up, uh, state your name and address, limit your remarks to three minutes. Uh, you're welcome to give information, uh, but please no confrontations and uh, uh, no demanding that somebody take a different position or whatever it might be. If you've got new information, if you've got uh, something you'd like to add, uh, we're more than welcome to listen to it. I am more than welcome to listen to it, but uh, let's try to keep this as uh, respectful as possible. Okay. So on a lighter you? note, I want to say that Jason Painter, Township Trustee, has a new baby, Ethan Charles, painter, and he's a big boy like Jason. So let's congratulate him, read him into the record, and welcome a new civil servant to uh, Seneca County. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is I was made aware that there have been some uh, radio ads ran regarding Commissioner Kirshner. Um, I don't have any knowledge on who's doing them. I don't agree with it. Uh, if anybody knows who's doing it, I ask them to stop. <coughs> I think it's inappropriate. Uh, Mike Kirshner is my friend. <coughs> He's a good commissioner. He and I have a different opinion on this. And that's fine. That's where there's a lots of two to, two to one votes around here. But, uh, you know, there's been weaponization of public records request against Mike, against Holly, against myself. I don't think it's appropriate. Um, social media attacks on Commissioner Stacy. She's my friend. I don't agree with it. I ask you to stop. So if anybody knows who is responsible, I'm putting it out there that I would appreciate that they stop the radio ads, stop, stop the social media attack. So we're just trying to do what's best in the county. We're not all going to agree, um, but our interest is with the county. So we're all in the same community. Well, the radio ads are sponsored by Economic Prosperity Project, with the, which is a liberal uh, PAC uh, funded in part by uh, alternative energy companies. Uh, they have the power to accept donations from uh, those folks. Uh, those uh, ads are being played throughout Northwest Ohio. So it's called the Economic Prosperity Project. For those of you who might be interested, I think it's economicprosperityproject.com. Uh, and the other ones that are running ads or, uh, or attempt to run ads are a company called uh, Checks and Balances. And they are a clean energy blog. Um, uh, they're clean energy activism. They're also uh, they are also being uh, advised by a company called TigerCom Strategic Support, uh, who has an intensive level of service design for companies, organizations, and leaders working in clean energy um, and other types of uh, fields like that. So they are both uh, left-wing liberal organizations, um, historically uh, uh, PACs that are funded. How, how people from Columbus and nationally think they can influence the people in Seneca County by throwing money at things is beyond me, but that's where we're at here. Uh, I think it's important enough to, uh, uh, from Columbus, Ohio, uh, to tell the people in Seneca County how they ought to vote. So that's where we're at. Public and comments. I would concur with Mr. Thomas on that's nothing we've condoned and uh, anything here for anybody to think that is wrong because I heard, finally heard it this morning. That's the first I even heard the ad, so. It's just anything we would wish on each other. And we don't. I don't like puppies or little children. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jim. Uh, Jim Fiesel, Rural Tiffin. Whoops. Excuse me. Uh, just got a couple things. Of the less than three minutes. Here's a copy for you. So you can do 
table if you want to. Um, last week I came in <coughs> and uh, kind of dropped some new information and it seemed unbelievable to some of the people in the room, but it's been proven to be true. I had a conference with Derek Devine, he's in full agreement, and we know what we're talking about, so we're moving on from that point. Uh, today I have two more pieces of information that are new, and I think Shane and Holly will be very happy about them. Um, and this may seem untrue and different than what everybody's believing, but I can assure you that it's been fact-checked. This is true stuff. Uh, first, regard to Ruma. We know that a pilot comes with the Ruma, and I know this is very important to Holly. She has mentioned it many times. Yesterday I met with uh, Mark Zimmerman, our county engineer, and one of the topics I wanted to discuss with him was the Rover pipeline and how that was handled because it was not a pilot associated with that. And he said there was a Ruma associated with it. And he said that a Ruma was in place for that project and he assured me that pilot or no pilot, he would require a Ruma for the wind projects. The alternative for the construction company would be to apply for special heavy use permits for every little part of the project and they do not want to do that. Each, part, each permit would take time to process and the companies would not want to go that route. So the good news is, Holly, the roads are protected with the Ruma, pilot or no pilot. And that's new information. Uh, next, Dave Wright and I, Dave Wright's, uh, he's not here today, but he's the uh, Reed Township trustee. We had a talk with Peter Polowski, VP of S Power, uh, for an hour after Thursday's meeting in Attica. And I expressed my concern to him that a flat $9,000 per megawatt, a number from nine years ago, stretched out 30 years into the future with no adjustment for inflation is not really a good deal for the county. And he looked right at me and he agreed with me. Mm. And he explained that under current Ohio law, the 9,000 number was the most allowed for a pilot program. And he said that was unfortunate. So I flat out asked him, I said, would you build without a pilot and instead pay normal real estate taxes? He looked right at me and said, yes, we would. That's new information. That's something we've not considered in this room before. So, you know, I believe when a person is presented with new information, that they should adjust their thinking to incorporate that new information. And when a company expresses willingness to pay more in taxes than a pilot program allows, and knowing that the roads will be protected, then I believe the county would be remiss if it did not opt for a better deal than a pilot would allow. You know, I will admit, in my mind, uh, most everybody in this, well, not everybody, but most people in this room, in their minds too, that the best option would be no turbines um, being built in the county. That would be the best scenario. But if that option is off the table, then the second best scenario would be to have turbines and get the most money possible for the schools in the county. And the least best option, and the one we seem to be headed for, is lots of turbines and a much smaller amount of money with no inflation protection. You know, maybe we can't get to the point of having no turbines, as many in this room would hope, but we don't have to accept the much lesser amount of money that a pilot would bring in. Maybe the best option in compromise lies in accepting the inevitable turbines and getting the full amount of taxes that are offered and they're on the table now. Uh, I would hope that the commissioners would consider a path to a better outcome and move quickly before the door closes and the better option is no longer available. <coughs> the best interest of Seneca County are at stake here the compromise that may help the people of the county accept the projects easier will not be available for long. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things I want to say about Jim, I appreciate your, your work on this and, and your thoughtfulness. And you know, one of the, the, the questions is, are the commissioners uh, listening and are they hearing you? And I just, I just took a, a look on my inbox and we've had you know over 30 email exchanges between us so uh you know the, the the accusation that we aren't listening or that we're not engaging that narrative is false and we've we've you know you and i have engaged <clears throat> we don't agree all the time but we've agreed on some things but we we've engaged it seems like a meaningful input has not really been allowed because it's always the comeback is this decision's been made there's no option to change it and we know that's not the case anymore mm -hmm. from last week we know that 
I just have one follow-up question. Can you quantify for me? We talked about the nine thousand dollars per megawatt and what that means. Mm -hmm. that, that equates to a million eight, a million nine a year. Something like that. Yeah. I'm not here to do math. What does, right the <laughs> if they're they're willing to pay uh, uh, normal real estate property taxes? What does that? It would be three times minimum. So a, mi a minimum of six million dollars or thereabouts. Only in the only in the first year though. Pardon? That's not for the life of the project. It I had the, that conversation, Sarah, with uh, Mr. Pulowski, and that was his comment. This will depreciate the amount of taxes will right. go down. But inflation comes into play there, <clears throat> and we had the discussion back and forth that probably, most probably, the amount paid in taxes would never go as low or lower than the pilot starts out at. And he did not disagree with that. Well, I've, I've heard this discussion about depreciation. We certainly had it, but you know, the question I would ask is: group of six million dollars in your hand today, better than six million dollars three years from now uh, at two million dollars a year? Uh, what is the time value of money? There's, there's a significant discussion to be had about that. Uh, you know, theoretically, at seven percent in ten years, you double your money. At ten percent, you double your money every seven years. So you sell early our investment portfolio. If that money went into an investment portfolio. What would that be worth six or eight or ten years from now? Uh, if we don't have it, we can't invest it. The the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, part of this, our companies have it in their pockets. You have the investment expertise on the board. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, other comments. Dalton's trying to get in on the Yes, Dalton. No. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> One of those outside the room. Dalton, I'm with Apex. Um, I wanted to add some context on the RUMA point, the road use agreement point uh, that was made. Um, as you know, for, per the AEZ, we do have to provide, or we do have to agree to a road use agreement with the county engineer um, that establishes basically the requirements for fixes we make during construction um, and then after construction as well. Um, without, without an AEZ, we have a requirement by state law to have a road use agreement for decommissioning purposes. And so that's for 40 years down the line. Um, any damage we cause removing these towers, we have to go back and repair. But there's no requirement for state rule to have any road use agreement in place for construction activities. Except and so for the one that the county engineer said he will do. He says he will do it. We have no, we're under no obligation to negotiate with him one of those agreements. Well, then you will be going agency. to him for a heavy low haul permit with every single truckload. And I don't think, he said that companies come to him in a big project and ask for a room. They want a room. They don't want to go through the other way of doing it. It sounds like you discussed with him a, a large pipeline coming through, which has different federal requirements. And this and project, too. We discussed this project as well. Sure. And how we um, operate. And so we have different requirements than large pipelines coming through areas. And so that's just a distinction we need to make here is that we're operating under different state and federal laws. Well, in his, uh, his conversation, he said that Rover did not have to do a Roma, but they wanted a Roma. Just like you wouldn't have to do a Roma without a pilot. But he said any company that comes in with a large <coughs> project does not want to. He said every time a heavy use haul permit comes in, there's a two week turnaround in his office. Not because he wants there to be, but he said it just takes that long. And that's no not project. long in the scope of things, to be fair. Now, it's, what's important to, for me to note is that we need to make sure we're not being misleading with the RUMA because we're not required to have one for construction. I'm not without saying the law says you have to, no. Right. And so we're under no obligation. And so what, I, what I'm saying is that we're not saying, you know, Negotiation with with Mark with the county engineer has to happen uh, for construction activities. That's not you something would be required. liable for the condition of the roads one way or another. There's no getting around that. And and a rumor would be. I mean, Mark would require it. And if you didn't want to work with him on that, it would be a tough road to hold for the construction company. Not impossible. Um, so it's, it's it may it's not be in the state note. law, but that's our county engineer. That's the way it works in our county. And you know, no company is going to come in and destroy our roads. They're going to have to get heavy haul permits for every single load, if they're heavy. And lots of these will be. You know, probably a thousand of these will be. Another note is we we intend to have a room. Up. We would like to have a room for construction. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason. Oh, no. Gotcha. Bill, as 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 you folks are aware, there is an AEZ in the county. We're not advocating for a move. <laughs> I don't want to be confused to where I guess you guys are kind of attacking on both ends. We want there to be an AZ in the county. If well, there's no AZ, we're not required there, can we to have this discussion for a minute because sure. should we, we do constantly. This yeah. I mean, I don't know. This is really okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. This, it's public comment. Three minutes. Sure. Uh, so I think okay. we need to. Uh, we need to you guys can work this out and report back. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. Other comments, please. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, hearing none, we are adjourned. Oh, 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 yeah. Wait, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stand up, please, so I can see you. Yes. Jason Smith, I'm Township. Yes, thank you. Are we you. still on? Um, are we in? It's adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Right. We are not adjourned. You may have already covered this, maybe not. It's the only second meeting I've been to, but I have done a, a little research and I found a company out of Chicago called McCann Appraisal LLC. You may be aware of them, you may not be. Um, they've done four studies that I've found so far, two in Ohio, one in Ontario, Canada, and one in Indiana. I got the report right here for the Indiana version. Um, basically what they've come to, and they're a completely independent uh, appraiser, what they've come to is that every one of these projects, within a, if you live within a three mile radius of one of these towers, your um, property value will decrease on average 23%. So, you may not think it's true, but it's out there. I can, I'm gonna give this to you, and what I'm also going to give you is, I, I did some research on the uh, County Commissioners Association of Ohio, looked at their handbook. And in that handbook, section 8.06, liability and immunity of individual officials and employees, Officials and employees, not independent contractors, are immune from liability unless one of the following applies. The acts are manifestly outside the scope of employment or official responsibility, one, or, number two, the acts are made with malicious purpose, in bad faith, or in wanton or reckless manner. What this means is, knowing that there's potential health risk with these wind turbines, turbines knowing there's potential property value, issues with every resident in here, in here without looking at both sides of this and giving us our, our voice in my opinion that may be able to be proved as reckless in a court of law meaning as a commissioner allowing this to happen you could potentially be held liable personally okay thank you i'm not a lawyer i'm just <coughs> not a lawyer but stuff the hell in last night <laughs> yes <coughs> I don't want to miss anybody else. Yes, ma'am. I'm yes. Donna Hudasek. I'm from Republic. Yes, Donna. Um, I just want to make a comment. You know, if you've seen the news at all this week, um, there was a new study that was issued that talked about particulates in our lungs, and, and most specifically, it talked about uh, electric generation particulates reduces the life expectancy in all of us. And it's proven scientifically. Um, and so if we can do anything to reduce that output and the particulates in the air in any way, shape, or form, don't we owe that to our children and grandchildren? If we don't like the way they look or on anything else, the other stuff has all been disproven. But this is a scientific study that was proven. It reduces the lifespan. And where do they come from? Where do what? Where do those, those out, particulates? Out, where do they come from? Here. You're saying that you we don't. Know, we don't you have something to say. My name is Lisa Wilson, yes, and I'm please. from Bellevue. Okay. She's throwing out this fact that is just so random. Where do these particulates come from? From the coal. Do you think that these wind turbines of yours are gonna are gonna eliminate them in our environment? Yeah. yeah. Just to a good degree. Where did you get your okay. facts okay. from? That's Great. Are you attacking me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, great. Oh my God, so typical. Okay. Oh, so typical. Changing subject. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're talk about first, first thing I want to comment on, I, don't know how, I thought what I was going to hear is recent news, just so everybody's aware, there was a turbine blade failure in the Van Wert project on Saturday, a mm -hmm. blade fracture. That stuff does happen on average, 3,800 blade failures a year. So that isn't a myth. Just that's kind of a recent news story. Secondly, I want to re defer back to Jim Fiesel. Jim met with Prosecutor Devine yesterday and got clarification on this issue about whether or not the Republic Wind and the Seneca Wind projects have been approved by the pilot. I know there was confusion about that last week. Holly, you had read the, the May memo from Prosecutor Devine <coughs> he had made a at that time. And Jim worked with the prosecutor to walk through the process and the prosecutor acknowledged the fact that 
the pilot program the pilot had not been approved for either one of the projects so that seemed to be a big point of disagreement or or not disagreement just wasn't clear in the past but it appears that that now is clear and prosecutor divine i know was to send an email to the commissioners to uh, clarify that point so that's an important deal so what that means is if the pilots haven't been approved then the power is right here in this room in order to stop the projects or approve those projects and i'm just asking the commissioners do you acknowledge that that is the case well you have to, i think you have to reword again I, i'm asking you not to challenge the commissioner i'm asking you to give new information mm -hmm. the question is not whether do we have the power to stop or not stop the project the question is do we have the ability to accept or reject the pilot the the alternative energy companies would make the decision as to whether they move forward with the true. projects or not from that point so the question here is do we have the ability to accept or reject the pilot program that will be put before us according to divine's uh, memo to me the way that i read it was that we have not yet signed for the pilot we have not yet certified it and therefore we have the ability to negotiate with the alternative energy companies for a better deal to make sure that everybody heard this both of the energy companies in separate conversations have said that a nine thousand dollar compensation per megawatt is extremely low however that's the maximum amount that ohio statute allows at this point in time and i am certain that both of those companies would pay more uh, I don't know what their choking point would be, but clearly would pay more to the residents of Seneca County than $9,000 a megawatt. I don't think anybody's going to dispute that. Uh, so that that's where that's at. So we, it's not that we have the power to stop the projects. It's that we have the power to renegotiate what is the payment in lieu of taxes. Mm -hmm. But that's new information. That was not That clear. is different information than last week, that's well, for sure. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Hey, Clark. Yes, sir. I'm outside town here. Uh, I got a question. What you were talking about on the, the nine thousand dollars per megawatt? Yes. Okay. The nine. If I understand this correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, the nine thousand dollars per megawatt is, is figured off of what the, the turbine com companies are saying are at their maximum. The point, yeah. Performance. Right. Which they're basing that off of forty percent efficiency. Is what S power told us. Yeah, yeah. It depends, it depends, it depends on who you're talking to about efficiency. That, well, yeah, that's you're pay, they're paying it's it's on space, the plate capacity. Yeah, it's it's no plate. capacity. Right. Yeah, no, so no, they're no, no percentages of efficiency. Okay, so what happens What happens to the cost as the efficiency of, of these motors go and it loses the efficiency as the production? There's no conversation about efficiency. It's just but how, built, built capacity. So it's nine thousand dollars flat out nameplate. Right. The, so the these only are twisting or not. Right. Yeah. The, the only conversation. That's, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Good the, clarification. The only question about efficiency is if you calculated what income tax obligation would be based on the amount of generated megawatts, you would have to include in that calculation what we can't show the full plate capacity. You would have to show what the probable percentage of efficiency was. Uh, you can't. The, you can't charge them the full amount because they're running you know I've heard 8% and I've heard 50% but somewhere in between lies the truth I think that uh, acceptable number is somewhere around 40. Now you're on an income tax is that what you're talking yeah. about? I'm saying if you had to calculate how much income tax they would have to pay per generation of megawatt. Uh, is that like a federal thing? On a federal basis? Because well, our, ours is only based no, on face plate capacity. I understand that. Well, we're talking about how much is the project being subsidized uh, <coughs> as a whole, universally, right. so both on a local uh, Jim Jordan and a federal question. basis? Yeah. yeah. Jim Jordan. Question. How much are we subsidizing this project based on what they would pay under ordinary tax taxable situation? Yeah. And on a, I had one other thing I wanted to ask about too, Mike. Uh, talking to S Power on Thursday, there they said uh, on some of these roads and stuff. You know, going back to what you were talking about on the roads. Uh, these things are up and running for the next three, four years. When one goes down, they got to go back in and tear all these roads back out, to put accesses back in, to be able to tear these back down. Is that cost figured into to what they're telling us? I don't know that. I just assume that this still would be part of the real bind. If they had to go and make repairs, they'd have to bring it back to the same level that it was before. 
I mean, you know, some of them are pretty extensive with what they got to do to yeah. get around houses and everything. Sure. Yeah. I, I just had a question. Well, well, let me, I have one of the young ladies over here yeah. a different view. I, I I'm Suzanne Apple from Sufio Township, and my husband and I have been in the wind uh, domain since we toured the big uh, wind farm in California. There were 5,000 wind turbines, and we were given a tour around there, and we, I've been all in for wind since. Um, when they came around in 2009, we signed up <coughs> very quickly because we think that that will help save our children and grandchildren. Um, we do not want, care about the, the coal industry, I'm sorry, but I think that they, pro they produce too many uh, carbons, um, arsenic and mercury and everything else unless the companies would decide to really do a good job of putting in the protections, but most of them haven't. Okay, so my question is, Mr. Fiesel, I believe, has written in the paper about why don't you guys get rid of the AEZ, but that my understanding was that that is like a welcome mat to business, and if you rescind that and cancel that, then that kind of says, well, we don't want any business in Seneca County. Is that my right interpretation? I think, I, I, we don't. If you no, first of all, there's 11. There are 11 counties in the state of Ohio out of 88 that have an ADC, and it's not for any company. It's for alternative energy companies, by right? alternative energy zone. Okay, so if you rescind for. it, solar and wind says, oh, goodbye, Seneca County? No, they, no. They, they would then have to come directly and negotiate with the commissioners to deal rather than taking the deal that the AEZ offers. They would be forced at that point to come to this Board of Commission. There are alternative energy companies in counties who do not have AEZs. I guess okay. that's the easiest way to say it. But they have to come to the Board of Commissioners of that county and negotiate what their compensation would be to the county because under the AEZ there's already a compensation under the pilot. But I think in question, I think it was probably developed as an econo economic development. Yeah, I, tool, I think the intention in the was the toolbox sure. yeah. to make it level playing field for any. I just don't want anybody to think that if we take an AEZ away that we're telling other companies all oh, an alternative energy to go away. That's not true. That's not the point. No, okay. not at all. Mr. Thompson, I think you were. Yep, I just had a point of clarification or a question. Um, the gentleman that spoke about the study that just came out for property devaluation, what was the date on that? It didn't just come out, it was from 2013. Okay, well, that's uh, fairly speak recent. Up, please, so we can get it. So the, so the reason I ask is there was an earlier study, and I believe it was done in 2004, maybe earlier. It's called the Berkeley study, and that's the one that came out, told everybody that the loss of property value was insignificant <coughs> due to wind farms, but that was, I'm not sure of the date. I'm sure it was pretty early. So I wanted you all to understand that what he's talking about is much further along in the evolution of wind farms, 2013 compared to 2000, a lot of new information's out there. And, and I don't know if you believe that wind farms do devalue properties. I don't, I don't know where you're at on that, but to clarify what he's saying, that's very recent news. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it turns. I'm certain that the uh, wind industry can show you statistics and studies that were done in 2014, 15, 16 that show that uh, there's an equal value or maybe an increased value. So there is a lot of research out there, and I've read a lot of articles. So I think that we all have to keep our minds wrapped around the fact that if you can research this subject and come up with any conclusion you want if you want to talk about scientific professional articles. There's articles that say that there are more particulates in the air generated by wind than there are by coal, that they're more dangerous. There's articles that say that say uh, uh, coal is more dangerous. So the, the, there, there are, there are, there is all that research. Yes, sir. In the back. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dan Kim at Eden Township. Um, on the Ohio Siding Board, the application for S power is there, and it describes everything, page by page by page that they're going to do when they come in to do the project, the widening of the roads, what they're going to do. It discusses building the bases <coughs> for these towers. And it states in there about dynamiting into the rock layer to establish these bases. Okay, 
out in the country, each one of us has our county wells, and they can range anywhere from 40 to 80 <coughs> feet, okay? They're gonna be digging these faces down in the range of our wells. If they start dynamiting into the rock layers, okay, what happens if that just starts disturbing our wells out there? Who's, who's responsible for that? I'll let you defer that question to the energy companies. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer it. Yes, sir. Charlie Schultz from Woodville. I was wondering if we have any guarantee or any funds set aside by S Power in the event that they sell out, sell their lease, as happens uh, throughout the country very regularly, uh, and, and our roads are damaged. Where's that money going to be kept? for future road repairs? Well, there, I'll let, sure. uh, there's bonding in place for decommissioning. I'm not sure about the road repairs. You want to speak to that? So with, with the road use agreement through the AEZ, we have bonds in place with the county for road repairs. And you would otherwise too, according to Mr. Zimmerman. Yeah. Not according to state law. Um, but um, it sounds like there's this conversation that happened with Zimmerman that was discussing what negotiations could be. Don't make that's you know, less certain. You know, say it consistently, and I appreciate what you said. What you said is we will do the right thing. Okay? So when we talk about not being consistent with state law, I'm trying to be fair to everybody here. I believe that what you're suggesting from a standpoint of Apex, that you, you would follow the rumor whether there is an AEZ or not in place not because it's state law, but because it's the right thing to do. Is that true? What I'm saying more directly is that having an AEZ in place requires us by law to repair the roads, whereas without that, it's more discretionary. Okay. And so whether or not I would want to do the right thing is, is less applicable than what the law requires me to do. To clarify that statement, the AEZ and Aroma have nothing to do with each other. They keep equating AEZ and pilot. Pilot is where the rumor comes from and all the side benefits. You can have a pilot with no AEZ. The commissioners just have to say, okay, pilot. And that whole program is there. AEZ does not have to be in place. That's just a pre-approved vote by the commissioners if it isn't. Well, let me phrase it another way, maybe to clarify. Sure. Have you made an application in any other county that did not have an AEZ that you also complied with their road use vacancy rate? John, you answer that one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have. You have. Huron County. We are negotiating currently with the Huron County engineer without an AEZ in place. Good faith. Okay. Yeah, that's with a pilot. And so an AEZ, just to clarify uh, Jim's understanding, an AEZ is a county wide pilot functionally. A it's pilot a is a, a pilot can be a pilot. A pilot is approval <laughs> separate from the county. Um, but the AEZ, one of the tenants of the AEZ is the pilot, and one of the tenants of the pilot is Aruma. Are you so these, insisting, are, these are very, these are very connected. Okay. Are you insisting that you can't get a pilot without an AEZ? No. No. Okay, then that's what I'm saying. You can get a pilot without an AEZ. You can't to suggest that the, the AEZ or the pilot is not okay, connected so with so the question. Calls. The question was answered. So here in county, there is no AEZ. Correct. But you are complying with their Aruma or their version of Aruma. We are working on negotiating Aruma with them now. It is not completed, but we've already started Do negotiation. they have a pilot program? No, they have a resolution for pilot to support our project specifically. At what at what uh, expense to you? At the 9,000 per megawatt. Nine, okay. So the there is no negotiation the within the pilot nor the AEZ for okay. rates other than 9,000 per megawatt. If you have a pilot, that is your maximum yes, sir. Uh, that you can ask is $9,000 by statute. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Got it. So to get any more than that, the, the pilot would have to not be in place. That's correct. Okay. Okay. I think we've had enough. We are adjourned.